Uh, hello, I'm going to do this talk in, uh, in English, um, but uh, if there's any moment when what, anything I'm saying is not clear, please let me know and I'll try to translate it, um, and I'll try to speak as uh, clearly as possible. Um, so, yeah, first of all, thank you for coming. It's pretty great to be in the space. We've been working here with Gabriel for the last almost two weeks, uh, getting this place finalized and building this show. And I'm really excited for this space because I think it's going to be a really interesting spot for, for Bogota. And I have to say that, you know, having someone like uh, Gabriel Pulezio, uh, <laughs> to, who's, who's himself an artist and who also, re and who, because of that, really understands how to produce and how to show art, um, having this kind of support in the community and having this kind of uh, person that is uh, willing to, uh, you know, put the amount of effort that it takes to, to build a show um, is, is amazing. So uh, I really, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with this space. Um, so this, <laughs> bravo, bravo. Um, so this, um, this, this talk is going to be uh, a sort of a, a, a narrative that goes through uh, my, my career and my work, and both as an artist but also as a curator. And I will try to also develop some, some thoughts about new media arts, which is really the field that I'm most, I spent the most time in in the last, let's say, 15 or 20 years. And, um, and I'll try to kind of come to a conclusion about where this show comes from and where the ideas for this show comes from, sort of based through that, through that lens of, of new media arts. Um, so I'll just start by, you know, the beginning for me was that I, I was always interested in being a filmmaker. That was my ambition as a, as a, a, young, a young person. Um, and I didn't want to go to film school because I felt like film school was almost a way of, uh, you know, if you, if you want to be a filmmaker, maybe you want to learn about other things in life and then you bring those into film. Um, so what I did is I, I basically studied philosophy for four years. And then after that, I started a company in France where I was living in Paris that was called Disciple Films. And I did a lot of projects with um, uh, fashion uh, and also with um, the uh, sort of more experimental stuff with arts, etc. Yeah, so I was, I was sort of mixing this, uh, this idea of doing these sort of commercial projects for a lot of fashion companies, but then also starting to do some more experimental stuff with visual effects. And I started getting really interested in motion graphics and effects. And um, in 2000 and, um, 2006 and 2000 and late 2006, I moved to Los Angeles. And I got a job in a company called Frank the Plumber. And from the, from the logo, it looks like it's a plumbing company, but it was actually a company that made graphics for concerts. So uh, they would basically design the stage, the video components of big tours um, so, you know, the clients that we worked for were like uh, Beyonce, uh, Madonna, uh, Rihanna, um, uh, sort of uh, Stevie Wonder, like all these kind of big names. And for me, this was a big, uh, a big revelation, this, this job, because I, I sort of learned that uh, making imagery didn't have to be in like a, a regular screen. Um, you could sort of make imagery then that was designed to be presented in a physical space. And so using, you know, moving screens and, and sort of audio reactivity and programming and things like that. Um, at the time, also, there was something that was becoming very trendy, which was uh, projection mapping. And I was invited to participate in a project that was run by a French company in Mexico City. And they were asked to basically design a, a show for the 150th anniversary of the Mexican independence. So we took over the Zocalo Square in Mexico City and we worked for a month with a team of people and we basically built about an hour's worth of animations that were talking about the history of Mexico and that were all projection mapped on these buildings. And we had you know, hundreds of thousands of people who were coming to see this. So this was also a really big sort of eye-opener for me in, in terms of um, spatialized imagery. Um, the next project that I sort of started taking on in this field was um, a, with an artist called Doug Aitken. Um, if you don't know him, Doug Aitken is a, is a very important uh, living American artist who does um, a combination of things. He started doing a lot of art films, then sculptures, um, and then he was asked basically to take over this building in Seattle. And the building uh, was the Museum of Contemporary Art. And the idea was that he was going to make it a mirror of the city. So um, he had all these LEDs on the building, 
And the idea was that there were sensors that were picking up activity from the town. So, for example, cameras, uh, you know, the, what, day of the, what day of the year, what day of the week was it? Was it raining? Was it good weather? And based on that, we had to build a system that was endlessly creating new uh, edits of, of footage. So it was almost like an, a machine that could constantly create um, new things with, uh, with, a, with a limited amount of, of a material. Um, then I did this project for Nike, which was really interesting because I had to do a lot of research for this. Um, this was uh, essentially a, a project where they were trying to release these very high-tech uh, new uh, clothes and shoes. And they wanted a very high-tech way of presenting it. So we basically did this, uh, something at the time was very difficult. Now you can do it with your phone. But it's called photogrammetry, where you essentially capture a human in 3D. And then you make a 3D model, and then you put it in a game engine. And so, you know, nowadays it's much easier to do. Um, but because I learned all these techniques in photogrammetry, then I started applying them in a more freeform way. I did this music video with, um, with a band called Gus Gus. And we basically did this very, very like uh, homemade photogrammetry, very uh, basic stuff. And, um, and then we were like essentially uh, messing with this footage and trying to make it look weird. Um, and then the, the next big project that was really interesting for me that sort of opened a lot of doors was a, a collaboration with a fashion uh, label called 3S4 that are based in New York. Um, and we had done a lot of projects together in the past, but this time we wanted to do something very... Um, we were very interested in the idea of fractals, 3D fractals. Um, and the, also the idea that, that fractals are like the infinite, but also the, the, the macro and the micro in the world. And the human is kind of in between the macro and the micro. And so the idea that was that these humans were placed in these crazy fractal environments and we were sort of diving into them, and every time we dove into another person, the next person appeared inside. So it was like a Russian dolls, you know, where one thing is, is buried inside of the other. Um, so this, this project was, was really interesting because it was a, it was a collaboration, uh, it was around fashion, but it was also presented as an art film. And so because of that, um, we were invited to show it in, uh, in a gallery in a, called Mana Contemporary, which is a space in New Jersey near, near New York, uh, where I ended up developing quite a relationship with these people because they were invited me to come and do a residency. So I spent two years in a residency over there, um, uh, sort of developing a solo show, which I'll talk about, and then also curating shows for them. Um, and then this is a project that was um, interesting as well because it was a commercial project for Google. Um, and Google needed to essentially present a new uh, database product. So something that's not very sexy, like it's you know, something that programmers use, but they wanted to find a way to present it in a way that felt interesting and, and beyond like just a pure uh, informative you know, uh, installation. So basically I designed this installation that was kind of inspired by minimalist sculpture and that was using all the data in this, in this software that they were releasing to create animations. And so there was a clear connection between the animations and the data, and the programmers could come and they could see, oh, there are ways of showing this kind of you know, stuff that programmers deal with uh, in ways that are not always just like uh, you know, charts and graphs and, and things that can maybe be a little bit more um, spatially interesting. Um, and then I kept on working. I, I did a lot of projects with Google. This was a project at the Met Museum uh, where they wanted to present a, a sort of, a, they have this thing called Google Arts and Culture where they scan a lot of uh, textiles and paintings. And so it was all about sort of presenting their collaboration with the Met Museum. And then I've also been doing um, uh, some work with a, an artist called Childish Gambino. So this is like tour design. But again, the idea was how do you do a tour that feels like it was designed in an artful way. It's not just about, you know, throwing everything you can at the audience and try to sort of make it more controlled and, and, um, and have a, a very strong aesthetic. Um, and then this was a, a collaboration with another musician called Martin Garrix in Amsterdam, where essentially it was about creating a room that was projected on all sides, but where the projection was um, reflected in these mirrors and there was an interactive element where people's, um, whenever somebody walked into the room, we could identify the colors that they were wearing and we could change the imagery based on their, on, on, on what they were wearing essentially. 
Um, and then in 2015, I had a great opportunity, which was to, I was approached by the uh, curator of a show in Warsaw, in Poland, at the Museum of Literature, and they were doing a show about a, a poetess, a Jewish poetess who lived in Poland before the Second World War called Susanna Ginczanka. And she was a very, very talented poet. Um, she was part of the sort of biggest literary circles in, in Warsaw. And she wrote one book. And this book was very, very important for, for poetry. But then she was killed by the Nazis. And uh, recently, she was rediscovered. So I was interested in her life because she had a very... Uh, dynamic and active life intellectually. And so this uh, shape that I designed was essentially a whirlwind, like a tornado, but it was made out of paper, out of sheets of paper, and it was projected for the first half, it was all going up, and that was like the upwards part of her life, and then the second part, it was all going down, and that was the, the sort of end of her life during the, the war where she was hiding from the Nazis. Um, and the sound of it was all based on this concept that maybe you guys know about called shepherd's tone. A shepherd's tone is a very interesting um, sonic phenomenon. It's like an illusion where if you play it, it, it always feels like it's going up forever or going down forever. So it has this very unsettling feeling because you, you feel like the sound is just like never going to stop. So that was the sort of the sonic aspect to this. Uh, here you see a little bit about um, how it was built. And this was a film that was done after the installation to sort of try to convey the same ideas as in the installation about the sort of fragility of this woman's life and her amazing talent through this whirlwind concept um, that was like replicated in different ways using hair and uh, paper, etc. Um, and then in 2015, again, also the same year, um, I started working with this festival called Day for Night. And I did an installation that was, I, at the time I was very interested in the uh, life of the sort of psychology of plant life. Um, and I, I wanted to create a piece that was essentially around what would, how would plants dream? And if, if plants were dreaming, would they dream together? Because they, you know, they, they sort of share the same air, they share the same soil. Um, and so the whole piece was essentially about plants falling asleep and dreaming. And I did this in 2015, but then I, I got a, a sort of a request to propose something for a, a space that opened in, uh, yeah, this was what it looked like without the projection. Um, I was invited to go to Las Vegas to this, uh, this group called Meow Wolf. Uh, Meow Wolf is like an um, entity that started in Santa Fe in New Mexico. And what they did is they started a space where people would basically pay for a ticket and they would spend hours and hours in this completely insane environment with all these different experiences. And it's sort of like, a, 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 imagine if it was Disney for people on psychedelics, like a very crazy kind of environment. Um, and so I took this idea of this plant dream life, but they gave me a big room, like a room that was maybe the size of the space, and they covered all of it with these plants. And so it was a much bigger version of the same, um, the same piece. Um, so this is a little edit of it. I was just, so this was just installed now in January, so it's very, very recent. Um, so then, um, Last few few works to talk about. This was a commission from Samsung. Um, again, uh, this was something for a, a very big space that they have in New York. And I used also this technique of working with fractals, um, which I really enjoyed for, for a few years because it's when you work with fractals, it's almost like you never really know what's going to happen. They're very, they're very infinite in a sense. Uh, and it was presented on this very, very big screen in New York um, in a Samsung uh, space. Um, where it was all built with these Samsung TVs, so it was very impressive at the scale. Um, and then in 2016, I did another commission. Um, this one was when I started really thinking less about nature and more about the digital world, uh, because you know, for, for people like myself who spend so much time working with computers, you end up developing a relationship with the computers and with the digital sphere, let's say. So um, in a sense, like the the idea that um, 
as a human with a computer, there's something, there's some chemistry that happens. And, uh, you know, there, there are some people who are bad with computers. Like, they, they come to a computer and the computer, like, doesn't like them. There's a, there's a, there's a chemistry. And some, so I sort of started exploring this idea of um, hardware, software, and then this piece was called blurware, which is like that middle zone between the hardware and the software where that, that's where your mind and the mind of the computer start mixing. And so I, I covered this heavy construction machine with pillows, um, and then I projected on the pillows. And this is what it looked like from the back. Um, and this is a show I did in Iceland in 2017 uh, in a herring, abandoned herring factory. And then this is my first solo show that I did at Mana Contemporary, this place in New Jersey that I was talking about earlier. And this was my sort of first exploration in a concept that I was very interested in because I started exploring like this sort of digital sphere. Um, and I started thinking that in a way there's, uh, there's these primal entities in the digital because in a sense when we think about the world, nature, uh, we think about you know, the sort of the most basic relationship that we can have beyond the senses is when we start thinking about it in terms of myth so or, or religion, right? So uh, if you look at the way that a lot of indigenous societies or primitive societies, primitive between quotes, um, are re ha relating with nature is that they see them as being spirit in infused with spirits. And so I thought, what if the digital had this these spiritual entities as well? And for me, I, I started thinking, what is the sort of the core? What is it that you need to make any image in the world? Well, you need power, you need electricity, um, you need colors, and in the digital sphere, you need red, green, and blue. Um, and then you need to combine all these things, and then the final thing you need is lights. And so lights, electricity, and colors were the sort of basic elements. So I started building a set, a series of installations that were based on these very, very primary elements um, and, and their sort of interplay. Um, so that, that's kind of the end of this arc that uh, was, let's say, a, a, a bunch of work that was done over the course of about 10 years, um, exploring you know, concepts through collaborations, through commissions, through working for people, but also through working for myself, and trying to land on some like themes that felt like they were very much the ones that I felt connected to. And so, of course, you know, as, as an artist, I, I had a practice with these things, but then I also started doing curation.